You've reached the stars. Now let's see you conquer. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome you to this webinar where we'll be talking about exchange rate risk and how you can hedge your portfolio against um, the risk of potential devaluation and also how we can benefit from views and perspective taking into consideration historical trends in CBM policies and movements in exchange rate generally. My name is Olajide Anolua. I am the moderator for this session and um, I'll just do a brief um, overview of the webinar and then I'm going to introduce our panelists who are going to do a thorough review of the historic, historical trend um, in exchange rate movement and also um, share perspective on how they think you can best hedge your portfolio and more or less enhance the value that is abound in the market. Uh, so let me do a brief recap and just overview of the topic in general. So we've seen um, persistent devaluation, we've seen decline in exchange rate values, Naira exchange rate value, you know, against the dollar and major other major currencies. We've seen this happening over, over the years. Investors have been losing value. Investors have complained that Naira returns are not um, enhancing their wealth. We've seen CBN come out this year to talk about technical adjustment to the currency. We witnessed um, like two to three devaluation of the currency. Investors have invested in Naira. Some of them, they've lost money in real value. Some investors, um, they now investors are craving for investment in foreign denominated currencies. Um, at the same time, we saw crude oil price decline at the beginning of the year, which negatively impacted uh, the Nigerian external reserve, which also declined. But fortunately for us, it didn't go below $30 billion. Um, all this also dovetail into negative GDP growth that we experienced in Q2 2020. Um, of course, all this um, inhibited the CBN ability to defend Naira, and this led to widespread shortage in FX availability. We've seen um, exclusion of certain um, items from um, FX provision from CBN. We've seen capital control measures. Foreign portfolio investors are unable to take their money out of the economy. Um, this has led to a lot of uh, backlog in FX demand. Um, Nigerian students abroad can afford to pay for school fees because of FX um, shortage. We've seen speculative demand in the parallel markets. We've seen the widespread between the iron heat window and the rate at which we can process or um, obtain FX at the, at, the, at the parallel market. So all these has created issues Investors have lost money, foreign investors are losing money, domestic investors are losing money in real terms. Inflation is eating into the value of returns. On a, on, on a real basis, um, we have negative returns in real terms. So uh, all these problems are there. So for us, we thought, how can we solve this problem? How can we help our clients to get better value? How can we hedge our portfolios and our wealth against potential devaluation? You know, we've learned from what has happened in the past. So how can we apply this knowledge or this understanding of how we're losing value, you know, going forward to make sure we don't lose value again? So um, in order to do justice to this topic, I'm going to be introducing one of the panelists um, to you. And I will do, um, I'm going to read his uh, profile. Um, do me the honor, let me introduce Mr. Olani Ogumbayo. Um, I'm going to do a brief um, review of his profile. Mr. Olani Ogumbayo is the, chief, is the MD CEO and also the Chief Investment Officer of Quant Investment Managers Limited. He has over a decade professional experience covering financial advisory, investment research and strategy, financial modeling, portfolio management, and security trading, having worked with top Nigerian banks and investment firms. Prior to his current endeavors, Olani worked as the CEO and MD of Affinity Capital Manage Management Limited, 
a boutique proprietary trading firm with primary focus on fixed income securities and currency hedge products. Before this, Olani worked as the pioneer head of fixed income trading, trading desk at Cardinals Com Partners, where he was primarily responsible for setting up and managing the firm's fixed income trading business. He also worked as a bond strategist or trader in the treasury department of Bank PH, PHP PLC, and he was a senior financial analyst and portfolio manager at PHB Asset Management Limited, where he initiated coverage reports on top 15 banks in Nigeria, and he later acted as portfolio manager covering the fixed income securities. He also worked with the strategy, strategy and financial modeling division of United Bank for Africa, UBA, where he was primarily responsible for developing financial planning and pricing models for various subsidiaries of the bank. He began his professional career at Maristem Securities Limited, a member of the Nigerian Stock Exchange, where he assumed the role of an equity research and corporate finance analyst, and he played a vital role in packaging equity capital raising for FTN Coco PLC and fixing healthcare PLC. Olani owed certifications in mathematics for financial engineers, statistics for financial engineers, and C++ programming for financial engineering from University of California, United States. He is also a first class graduate of economics from Obafemi Aulo University, OAU. He is an associate of the Institute of Chartered Accountants of Nigeria, ICANN, an associate of the Association of Chartered Satisfied Accountants, ACCA, United Kingdom, he is an associate of Chartered Institute of Stockbrokers, CIS. He is an authorized dealing clerk of the Nigerian Stock Exchange, a certified financial risk manager, FRM, um, of the Global Association of Risk Professional, GAP, United States. And he is also a CFA charter holder of the CFA Institute, United States. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome me as I present to you Mr. Olani. So. Thank you very much. Uh, our topic today, uh, as has been said, is about how to edge against risk of devaluation. Now, I believe that you can see my screen. Now, the outline for this uh, for today's program starts with we looking into insights about trying to get insight about the historical movement in exchange rate and what the implication is for investment. Then we look at this topic primarily from the perspective of a domestic investor that is looking to edge against risk of devaluation. Then we transit to the perspective of a foreign investor, how a foreign investor will edge against the valuation of Naira if they were to come to Nigeria to invest, then we summarize, you know, the implications of all of this. So let's start by first looking at the, at the implications, I mean, the insight into the historical movement in exchange rates. Now, the first thing we all know is that our currency has been depreciating consistently over the years. And between 1995 to 2020, the average annual rate of depreciation in the interbank market is over 6%. Also in the parallel or BDC market, the average rate of depreciation of Naira is at least 6.3% per annum. And based on these numbers, we can say that we have about over 95% probability that you have a devaluation in a five-year period. And it is almost certain that there will be devaluation over a six-year period. And in any case, whether it's over one-year period, two-year period, three-year period, so the minimum probability of devaluation is 64%. And over any given period, the average annual devaluation based on this data exceeds 
And beyond the average, what we've also observed is that in recent time, the trend or the pace of devaluation has been increasing, specifically since 2007. So the devaluation comes more often. And when they do come, we do have major adjustment, deep adjustments uh, to the value of the currency. So the key message from this is that we require, or an investor will require a minimum of 6% uh, premium to cover the valuation risk, irrespective of the investment horizon. And how are we exposed to devaluation risk? Now, the first source of exposure is where you have direct foreign obligations. For example, say you have foreign mortgages to pay, you have foreign school fees to pay, then you have foreign medical bills to pay. So the key here is that you have obligations that are in dollars or other foreign currency. And your earnings are mainly in Naira. So you are exposed significantly to the risk of devaluation. Because when there is devaluation, the Naira cost of servicing this year, foreign obligations increases. And it is, the risk is worse if your Naira income is fixed. Because it means when the devaluation occurs, you are not earning higher return in Naira, but your offshore obligations have increased in Naira terms. And we cannot underestimate how deep this can hurt investors. And I can give you an example of what happened during the last major devaluation, that means 2015-2016. So a number of HNIs that are taking mortgages to buy properties in places like London and so on and so forth. They suffered significant deterioration in their standard of living after the devaluation of 2016 because the offshore properties were not any enough income to cover the mortgage obligations. So they've been supporting the mortgage payments with their income in Nigeria. So with the devaluation, they used a higher, they used up the higher significance of their Naira income to cover this foreign mortgage obligation. And that affected their well-being because some other essential spendings that they should have made locally, they couldn't afford to make them. In fact, for some of them, they lost the property eventually because of default on their mortgage obligation. So when you have direct foreign obligations, you should be the most concerned about the valuation risk, particularly if your income is entirely in Naira terms and tends to be fixed over time. The other source of the valuation risk is direct spending on imported goods and services. So even when you don't have direct foreign obligations, an average Nigeria consumes imported uh, products. And when there is devaluation, the Naira cost of this product will increase proportionately. And if your income in Naira is fixed, it means the purchasing power of your income will drop. And that may affect your standard of living negatively. And this is particularly so for high net worth individuals, you know, whose propensity to consume imported goods is higher than that of an average Nigerian. On average, we spend about, last year we spent about 17% of our income on imported goods on average. But for the middle income and upper income individuals, you will expect that they spend way, way higher than that. So the higher the proportion of your income that is spent on imported goods and services, the higher your exposure to the risk of devaluation. And the third source of exposure, that's general inflation that may result from imported inflation due to devaluation. So devaluation raises the prices of uh, imported goods. And 
since we import some of the inputs into local production. So this increases in imported uh, pri uh, goods prices. We feed into the overall uh, inflation domestically. So even if you do not consume imported goods and services directly, the fact that some of the inputs used to make the goods and services in Nigeria were imported, so will increase the cost of domestic production and producers will pass this to consumers in form of higher prices. And with higher, so when the overall general price level increases, your purchasing power drops if your income does not increase in Naira terms. So what that means is that irrespective of who you are, you will be affected by devaluation if it ever happens. So essentially, devaluation affects everybody because of the impact on general, uh, general inflation. And that perhaps explains why uh, the central bank is very reluctant you know, uh, uh, to, to do a major devaluation because it affects everybody, so including the rich. And having talked about these sources of exposure, so how do we go about edging devaluation risk? So look at portfolio. So I say portfolio approaches to edging devaluation risk. Essentially, what I plan to address is whether you want to plan, the option of whether you want to plan against devaluation from this initial point of creating your portfolio, or you want to wait until you believe that the risk of devaluation is imminent before you tweak your portfolio to edge against devaluation risk. So these two options are what I call strategic asset allocation approach and tactical allocation approach to uh, edging the valuation risk. So on the strategic asset allocation approach, so from the day one we are constructing your portfolio, we look at considerations such as any fixed foreign obligations. Then we look at your lifestyle, your consumption patterns to see how much or uh, what proportion of your income is spent on imported goods and services so that we can assess the degree of your exposure to devaluation. And based on that, so when we construct your portfolio, we would have made some allocation to assets that we believe we edge either partly or fully against devaluation. And usually at that point, we'll be looking at say dollar denominated assets. So from the strategic asset allocation perspective, but that's the only option we have because, so, because the essence of planning for devaluation from day one is because you do not know when the devaluation will happen. You don't want to be caught unawares. So when there is unanticipated or sudden uh, devaluation. So from day one, so a part of your portfolio has been allocated to dollar denominated assets to cover part of your risk to, uh, to devaluation or part of your exposure to devaluation. But the major drawback of this approach is that since from day one you've invested in dollar denominated assets or securities, you know, your portfolio may underperform 100% or may underperform another portfolio that invests 100% in local securities during the period of stable exchange rates. Because the dollar securities typically offer lower interest rates compared to equivalent local Naira security. So if from the one, a part of your portfolio has been allocated to this lower yielding dollar securities because you want to be protected against unanticipated devaluation. So the expected return or the running return on your portfolio you know, in the meantime, may be lower than the running return on a 100% local portfolio, provided that there is no devalue. I mean, under the situation of stable exchange rate. Because the only time your portfolio in that context will have a chance of outperforming 
a local, an hundred percent local portfolio will be when there is devaluation. Then the return of that portfolio will be boosted. But if there is no devaluation over your investment horizon, your portfolio under this approach may eventually underperform, you know, a local portfolio or a portfolio that invests on represent locally. So the other approach to edging the devaluation risk is what I call tactical allocation approach. Now, under this approach, from the one that your portfolio is being constructed, we will ignore devaluation. So particularly if we have just had a major, uh, one, a major devaluation. So it is normal for us, you know, not to expect another major devaluation the following year or maybe two years out. So maybe we may not expect a major devaluation until three or four years after the last one. Now, having that in mind, so I can choose to ignore uh, including dollar denominated assets in my portfolio from day one. That means I do not have any protection against devaluation from day one, even though I have exposures to devaluation risk. Then I start with 100% local portfolio. Then when I assess or when I then realize that devaluation is imminent, then I adjust the allocation of my portfolio at that time to protect me against devaluation. And what that means is that you have to be monitoring market factors to assess or to determine when devaluation seems imminent. And one of the factors you have to look out for is movement in external reserves. So if I see that there is persistent decline in external reserves, for example, and I also see that there is sharp decline in international crude oil price, since crude oil sales is our primary foreign exchange earnings. And I see that there is increasing backlog of unfulfilled FX demand in the interbank market. And I see that the interest rates on local bonds or yields on local securities are dropping sharply, such that they, are, they look less competitive compared to returns or yields on euro bond securities. At that point, you know, there is, there is likely to be a conclusion that devaluation is imminent. And the other factor that you also look at is uh, based on the analysis of probability of devaluation and the historic movement, you know, it is almost certain that devaluation will happen, major devaluation will happen every four years or four or five years. So, the time that has passed between the last major devaluation and now also matters. The moment that I see that I'm experiencing or I'm observing these factors I've listed, and I see that about three years have passed since the last major devaluation, I will have reason to believe that the value, another devaluation, another major devaluation is imminent. At that point, I can then readjust the allocation of the, of the portfolio to cover the valuation risk. So what I would have achieved, what I would have achieved that way is I would have maintained a return for my portfolio that is competitive with what others are getting locally during the period of stable exchange rates. Then I only include the lower yielding dollar security at a time when I believe that the valuation is imminent. So it is very likely so uh, let me put it this way, that approach will most likely generate superior return to the approach under strategic asset allocation if the major devaluation does eventually happen, particularly if and, and it happens close to the time that the adjustment uh, to the allocation of the portfolio was made. So what's the major advantage of this tactical allocation approach? So that's what I just explained earlier that the portfolio earns the same higher local yield for the period of stable exchange rates until devaluation is imminent. And after devaluation, it delivers superior return. So overall, the return of this approach so may be superior to what you will get on that strategic asset allocation approach. 
But the major drawback of this approach is you are not protected against sudden or unanticipated devaluation. Because the major premise underlying that approach is that I will be able to time you know, devaluation. Um, I can tell when it is imminent, then I can make adjustment to my portfolio to protect me myself against the devaluation. But if the devaluation is sudden or unanticipated, then you would have been left exposed to devaluation risk. And at this point, when people do this tactical allocation, allocation you, know, uh, you know, people might say, oh, people speculating against the currency and something like that. Now, this is pure you know, investment strategy. Normally, it should have been tough you know, spotting the timing of the valuation if the FX market is market driven. Because if the FX market is market driven by forces of demand and supply, any major negative news is automatically reflected in the exchange rate. So if there's any sharp decline in crude oil price, the exchange rate will depreciate instantly such that you will not have the time you know, to carry out the tactical adjustment to your portfolio. But the case, that's not the case in Nigeria because we run a fixed exchange rate regime and usually the monetary authorities is always reluctant you know, to do a major devaluation even when the market forces are indicating that that might be uh, the next thing to do. So this gives room for investment managers or for portfolio managers you know, to make tactical adjustments to their uh, portfolio before the devaluation. So now, well, we said this, that the major problem of tactical allocation is you are not protected against sudden devaluation. But what if you have a combination of strategic and tactical allocation? That means from day one, you have some assets allocated against, to protect you against devaluation. The then when you do find out that, okay, devaluation seems imminent, you can then make a tactical adjustment to increase your edge against the uh, devaluation. So that way, from day one, you have some protection against devaluation. The then when it's and when it then looks imminent, you are able to increase your, your, uh, your exposure uh, to assets that will edge you against uh, devaluation. So, so our next task is, so what kind of asset or instrument can you use to carry out this edge? Now, the first and the easiest is to look at long position in US, USD, that's US dollar denominated assets. That means you can, from day one, either from day one or at the point of making tactical allocation. So you can just invest in some dollar denominated assets to protect yourself against devaluation. So, and I look at the different assets that you can have. Now, the first on the list is offshore equities. And I believe it is not ideal for your protection against devaluation because of its positive correlation with crude oil price. But usually in Nigeria, you know, when we, the devaluation usually happens after our major source of foreign earnings, you know, you know, has suffered. And that's when the crude oil price has dropped significantly. So if you invest in offshore equities as the edge against devaluation in Nigeria, when there's a major crisis, global crisis that results in sharp decline in crude oil prices, offshore equities will also drop in value at that point. So, and so even though they are denominated in dollars, the dollar value has dropped. So you might even lose more than what you will gain from the devaluation. So, so, I did. so the same goes for real estate. Uh, so they are, because of their cyclical na na nature, they are also, the, so, so it may have positive correlation with factors driving uh, devaluation. And the other thing you have to also note is that if the real estate is mortgage, like I explained earlier, you have some fixed obligations in dollars. So if there's major devaluation, you, know, you might not even be able to pay your mortgage. You may have to forfeit that real estate. That you might lose the assets, which is supposed to be your protection against devaluation. So offshore real estate also not ideal. You know, 
the, 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 the most ideal asset class for this uh, kind of edge is fixed income securities. And common on this list, US treasuries and euro bonds. Now, the US treasuries, if you do the US treasuries, you can be sure that when there's devaluation, the asset value will still be stable. So you will not lose money from the asset itself. So you, you'll be able to get the same dollar value. Then you benefit from the devaluation in Naira terms. But when you use euro bonds as your edge from day one, if it's strategic asset allocation approach, from day one, when, there, when the risk of devaluation is imminent, euro bond prices too will crash at that time. So if you will need cash or if you will need liquidity when there is the, when at that time, your assets that is supposed to be your protection, even though it's in dollar terms, you know, may have declined in value. That's if you use euro bonds. So you have to, uh, you have to weigh these two. So assets like US treasuries will be stable during the devaluation to protect your dollar value. But euro bonds, you know, may fall in value during that period of valuation, uh, during that period of devaluation, even though they tend to recover. So the key question is, would you need liquidity during the time of devaluation or you will not need extra cash from your edge, edging assets? If you will need liquidity during the period of devaluation, it might be best to use US treasuries as your edge because the value will be stable at that point. Now, but if you will not need liquidity, you know, you might be better off using euro bonds. Because even if the price, if the values of euro bonds decline during that period of the valuation, they tend to recover when everything is over. But if you will need liquidity, you will be forced to realize the loss at that, the loss in dollar terms at that point in time. And why the euro bonds are attractive is because, of course, the yields you get on them are way higher than the yields you get on US treasuries. But yields on US treasury now is almost 0%. Meanwhile, on Euro bonds, you can get like seven, somewhere between seven and 9% per annum. So the other edging option you have is you using uh, short positions in crude oil price. Because the valuation is usually preceded by sharp decline in crude oil price. So theoretically, you could set up a position you know, that will generate income when the crude oil price uh, crashes. And that is with taking a short position in crude oil. And the only viable option to do that is to use put option. That means use option to sell crude oil at a certain price. So that when the price of crude oil declines, so you make money from the put options. So why I said options, we can't use features. Because if there is no devaluation, I don't want to, or let's say crude oil prices go up, I don't want to have to pay up for anything. So my only cost of the edge is the price that I've paid for the put option. But this is only possible as part of the strategic asset allocation approach. Because if you want to do tactical, at the time you are doing tactical asset allocation, the crude oil price has already declined. So it won't work in that context. Then. You can also use local securities to do the edge, like you can use the local fixed income securities. But for local fixed income securities to be a good edge against the valuation, they must offer yield that is at least 6% above the yield on equivalent FGN euro bonds. And how do we come about that 6%? Remember, that's our long-term rate of depreciation in Naira, based on our uh, initial uh, slide. So, if, the, if you look at five-year maturity, for example, uh, the euro bond is offering 4.61%. Right, sorry, the euro bond is offering 5.73% as we speak. But the local FGM bond is offering 4.61%. So the dollar asset gives me over 5%, but the Naira asset is just giving me about 4%. So the Naira asset needs to give me at least 11.73% over a five-year period for me. So consider using it as an edge uh, against the valuation. The same for other maturities. So the Naira asset, look, Naira security needs to offer, need to offer at least 6% uh, return over what you get on euro bonds on a per annum basis. And local equities also can be used as edge against the valuation. 
particularly as part of tactical uh, allocation. We just need to know if we can find a company that sources its input 100% locally and exports its output 100%. Theoretically, that company, you know, will provide a edge against the valuation. So, because if the input are 100% sourced locally, so the prices of cost of production will remain relatively stable. It will just increase moderately when there's devaluation. Now, with the devaluation, the turnover will jump up proportionately if they export all the goods 100%. So, if you can find such, so there's no company like that that is 100% locally sourced input, then 100% out, export of output. But we should look for companies that are close to that. So, based on these two, Criteria. So you can have four possible, you can divide the companies in Nigeria into these four categories. So, so the one that is of most interest to us as a edge against the valuation is companies with high local uh, high, uh, input local content and high output, ex, uh, high proportion of output exported. And for these companies, I call them currency stabilizers. So if you can find more of these companies, you know, to invest in after the risk of devaluation has been reflected in their prices in the market. So you may, your portfolio may outperform, you know, uh, the market significantly as we recover from devaluation. So that is this perspective. All we've talked about is from the perspective of a domestic investor that wants to edge against uh, devaluation. Then how about the perspective of a foreign investor or a domestic investor who has a foreign capital or capital side of the country and he wants to bring it in to invest locally? So I look at the first option I look at that I can construct for these foreign investors, a portfolio of say, let's look at a portfolio of say one year government security plus what I call local NDFs. NDFs here stand for non-deliverable forwards. So that is the instrument that the foreign investor will use to edge against exchange rate risk. And in the scenario I have here, so if you have an initial investment of $1 million, and currently exchange rate in the interbank market or in window is around 395 Naira per dollar. So what that then means, if you bring your $1 million to Nigeria now, amount available for investment in Nigeria would be 395 million error. And currently, the, based on CBN and FMDM codes of one year forward rates. Now, you can edge your exchange rate risk by buying a one year forward at 424 naira per US dollar as of today. So that means you can lock down the exchange rate at 424 such that in one year's time, irrespective of the exchange rate in the market, you can convert your Naira back to dollar at 4.24. And currently, the one-year treasury yield in Nigeria is about 9.89% using the OMO rate. And I'm assuming that for you, usually some banks would require for collateral, you know, for the non-deliverable forward contract that protect you against exchange rate risk. But I'm assuming that there's no need for collateral or you use your securities that you bought with your money as collateral. Now, and I expect annual depreciation in Naira of 6% based on our long-term analysis. So under this scenario, so what you will end up with, your return in Naira terms under this scenario will be 8.93% in one year's time over a one year period. But in dollars time, in dollars terms, it will be 2.4%. So it's not a question whether the 2.4% is attractive enough in dollar terms to attract the foreign investor. But if you ask me, uh, my, my, my response would be that, you know, it's too low because a one year FGN Euro bond, as we speak today, we offer over 4% returns in dollar terms. So based on this, our base case scenario, foreign investor coming, investing at the current interest rate environment, when they edge their exchange rate risk over a one year period, 
can only expect to get 2.4% return in dollar term. Now, but if I then look at the likely scenario, even though my base case is based on the assumption that exchange rate will be 420 Naira in one year's time, based on the annual depreciation rate of 6%. So, but I expect that in one, year, one year's time, exchange rate might be between 480 Naira per dollar and 520 Naira per dollar. So when we look at this other aspect, so where exchange rate is 480 or higher than 480, or other, so even the return in dollar terms drops further. So with devaluation, the return to the, in Naira terms will increase for the foreign investor, but the return in dollar terms will decline. And why is that? Because, largely because the main reason is that the forward contract that protects you against exchange rate risk only protects your principal. So it, it doesn't cover your, your returns. And because of that, your returns will be fully affected by devaluation. So that's why the return in dollar terms declines with devaluation. But note this. So I understand that just before the lockdown, the central bank has started offering forward contracts that protect both the principal and the interest. So if the, both the principal and interest are protected under this base case scenario, the returns in dollar terms will be constant at 2.3%, irrespective of the level of the exchange rates. And 2.3% is, is still low compared to over 4% that you get on Nigerian dollar security over the same period. So, but what if at the end, in one year's time, even though you have a forward contract to buy dollar at 424 Naira per dollar, what if the dollar was not available at that time? Like it is the case now, where as the forward contracts are maturing, the investors cannot get the dollar because of liquidity problem, dollar scarcity, you know? And so, so that's, I call that USD liquidity risk. So if you must exit at that time, you don't have the option of rolling over. So how are you going to exit if you cannot get your dollar? So how do you price in this USD liquidity risk at exit time? So then we look at, so how do we assess USD liquidity risk? The best measure is to look for at the spread between the parallel market exchange rate and the interbank exchange rate. And the, the wider, this, in fact, as the, as the dollar scarcity gets worse, the spread typically widens. And as dollar liquidity improves, the spread tightens. So we can argue that the higher the spread between the parallel market and the interbank market, so the higher the US dollar liquidity risk. So if you look at what this spread has been over time between 1995 and 2020, in absolute terms, you know, after adjusting for the outliers, so you see that the average absolute premium over time is about eight Naira per USD. But if you look at it in relative terms, in percentage terms, so that would be about 5% of the interbank rate on average over time after taking out the outliers. So we, to factor in the liquidity risk into the investment process. So we, if there is gonna be dollar liquidity problem in one year's time when you need to exit your investment, so we assume that you may have to cover your dollar position from the parallel market or independent market or outside of interbank market. And at that point, that means is the parallel market exchange rate that will apply. So if I look at that scenario where there is no US liquidity at exit, so I have to factor in the parallel market premium. And what I did was to look at what I got from my absolute premium analysis and my relative premium analysis, and I took the simple average of that. So I can say that over a long period of time, you know, the, the average premium of parallel market over interbank will be about 14 Naira 50 cover per USD. So if I bring this into my calculation for the offshore investor, then if the offshore investor will have to cover this exposure in one year's time uh, in the parallel market under this base case scenario, the return in dollar terms will be minus 1%. And 
if the spread, like today, the spread is about 15 naira, 16 naira. If we should walk, look at a scenario where the spread, you know, between the parallel market and data bank is about 15 naira, the return in dollar, if that spread remains in one year's time, the return in dollar terms to the foreign investor will be as bad as minus 9% in dollar terms. So it is very important as a, you know, to look for ways, you know, to eliminate the spread between the parallel market and the interbank market, because that's the, uh, that's the most reliable indicator of US dollar liquidity in our market. So I believe beyond the level, what, beyond what we consider the appropriate level of exchange rate, it is important that we make the spread between the parallel market and the, and the interbank market to be as small as possible. Otherwise, it will discourage foreign, uh, foreign investments. So then I also look at the long-term perspective that what if the investor is coming for five years and the situation is even worse because now the five-year forward contract for the investor is currently priced at 590 Naira per USD. That means the investor comes in and buys a local NDL or not deliverable forward that covers five years of exchange rate risk. So it will lock in the price of 590 Naira per USD as its exchange rate in five years time. And if that is used, the effective return in dollar terms on this position, given where the yields on five year securities are currently priced, you know, the return in dollar terms would be minus 3.4%. For the investment, for the five year investment to to be worth the why of the foreign investor, we need the yield on a local five-year bond to be at least 14.13%, so that the return in dollar terms will be comparable to what is obtainable on the five-year government euro bond, which is naturally in dollar terms. So in summary, valuation affects all of us, but to varying degree. But you should know that it is almost certain that another major devaluation will occur within five years of a major devaluation without any major structural change in the Nigeria economy. And our working scenario or our estimate of long-term average annual uh, 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 devaluation or depreciation of Naira is, uh, is currently stand at 6%. And we recommend a combination of strategic and tactical allocation approach in managing the exchange rate uh, risk or risk of devaluation. And the ideal instrument for edging devaluation within a strategic allocation approach should be a USD denominated asset that is not positively correlated with the factors that cause devaluation, especially if there may be need for cash withdrawal, you know, when devaluation occurs. However, within tactical allocation, you have options. There are a variety of instruments available to edge the valuation. So what you just need to get right is the timing of that tactical allocation. If the timing is spot on, you know, uh, any instrument or any of the instruments I've listed will act as a very good edge. And more importantly, it will be difficult for the risk of devaluation to subside under the current market conditions due to the following reasons. Because use on local securities are too unattractive you know, compared to what we get on euro bond securities issued by our own government. So we need local yields to be at least 600 basis points above the yields on you know, comparable euro bonds for investors to be very comfortable in using local securities as edge against the valuation. Then also know that foreign investors now realize that they underestimated the risk of US liquidity in Nigeria, given what is currently happening. So it may be very difficult to get them to bring in additional inflows, even when we raise our domestic interest rates. So because the risk, the US dollar liquidity risk is now, seems, now seems to be the, 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 the bigger factor. And that's why it's very important that the monetary authority looks for ways to, you know, to, to compress the spread between the parallel markets and the interbank markets. So, and even if we do not price in the US liquidity risk, US dollar liquidity risk, the expected USD return on local short and long-term securities 
see pale in comparison to what is obtainable on equivalent euro bonds. Like I said earlier, you know, uh, on the short end, you will need at least a return of 12% locally to be comparable to what is obtainable on euro bonds in dollar terms. And on long-term securities, you will need a yield of at least 14% locally to give a return in dollars that will be comparable to what is obtainable on euro bonds you know, over the same maturity. And that will be at the end of the session. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ni Mbayo, for the wonderful presentation. Uh, before we do any overcar or summary or recap of what you've said, we'll just um, bring in the second panelist to um, also hear his perspective. So I'll be bringing on board Mr. Tao Yusuf. So let me read his uh, brief profile. Uh, Mr. Tao Yusuf is the head of asset management at Merged Wealth Management Limited. Um, he also serves as fund manager for CBN Power Sector Intervention Facility, which is CBN NEMSF. Uh, Mr. Tao began his career at Meristem as the head of investment research and strategy in 2011. He is a graduate of University of Lagos. He is a CFE charter holder, and he has managed a portfolio in excess of 300 billion naira. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome as I present to you, Mr. Tao Yusuf. Good morning, everyone. Uh, good morning, um, Anu, and thanks for the um, wonderful presentation. Um, mine will just to will just be to more or less extend the discussion that Ni has um, um, shared, and um, just to bring um, some um, additional perspective. Um, to what he um, described earlier. Um, and also, you know, essentially just extend the discussion, uh, both from the perspective of the domestic investor and the, um, the foreign investor as well. Um, I will try as much as possible not to um, uh, take so much time on some of the things that um, he, he has already highlighted. Um, but first, we'll go into the, um, the slides right now. Um, just like he said earlier, when we talk about investment, we're talking, we are looking at investment return. I hope you can see my slide. Can you see my slide? Yes, we can. Okay. Now when we talk about investment return, essentially we can we look at it from uh, um, the perspective of a foreign investor and um, the perspective of um, a domestic investor. Um, now when we say foreign investor, we are more or less looking at so. A, uh, in this instance, uh, I'm looking from the perspective of, of an Nigerian investor um, that, that is investing in foreign assets. Um, and also as a domestic investor, talking strictly from the perspective of an Nigerian investor um, investing locally. Um, and when you look at, when you talk about return, you are, you are, you are looking, um, you are taking cognizance of return, uh, both in terms of the return, the assets that you hold is generating, and also in terms of, um, um, return from um, currency um, movement or from inflationary pressure as well, or the purchasing power ability of your investment. Um, I would, my, my presentation largely looks from, the, uh, from a data perspective and try as much as possible to be very graphical, um, which, which more or less is uh, more or less extending some of the things that um, uh, Bio um, Ni has um, um, shown in his presentation. But this will more or less be showing us from the past in a graph in graphical way. Um, now, when we talk about investment return from, from the perspective of a local investor, um, for instance, what I use largely in this presentation is um, a fixed income return, fixed income return, Nigerian issued instrument, and also a foreign issued instrument. In this slide, what we are seeing essentially is what the trend of a Nigeria one year bill. Has been in the in roughly the, the last twelve in the last twelve years, and comparing that to what the inflation um, has been over the same period. And if you look at this slide, you will see that over the last over the twelve year period, you've had instances where the return that uh, the one year bill or one year treasury bill generates is um, higher um, in in average over a twelve year period. The only times that we've had instances where the Nigerian one-year bill is lower than the inflation is what we are currently experiencing, and sometimes between 2008 and 2010. 
And um, if we consider what happened in two, those two periods, um, those are periods more or less, um, well, I would say some forms. Maybe can you put your presentation in slides mode so that um, we can see it, it, it will be bigger. Okay. okay. Can you see it in slide mode now? Yes, we can. Thank you. Okay. All right. Um, those are periods where you could refer to more or less um, some form of um, if economic or financial crisis that the, um, um, that the country has to, to grapple with. Um, but outside of those periods, we are, uh, there are periods where um, treasury bill rates are above um, the inflation rates. And um, uh, uh, taking this into perspective, this, the periods where the exchange rates um, where the interest rate is, uh, where the one-year bill is higher than inflation. On the average, um, we have over the 10-year period about maybe about 8%, uh, which adequately compensates for um, the loss of purchasing power that ordinarily um, um, inflation um, takes away from, from um, investors' return, essentially. So in terms of positive real return, we have, this, uh, we have a period of eight years where the return is um, higher uh, as in the, over the inflation. Going to the next slide, um, this essentially is just trying to um, bring into the mix the exchange rates. And um, this is just um, slightly just trying to see what happened, a, a very short three year snapshot. We still go into details of discussing the exchange rate movement over a, over a longer period. and trying to see the implications um, of um, exchange rates on the investment on the investment return. Um, in 2010, for instance, we have a one-year bill at, um, on the average, about 6.12%. And in that same year, inflation 13.76. Um, exchange rate um, interbank was 152. Um, by 2015, we are seeing exchange rates interbank at about 199.3. Um, and if you compare what, um, in terms of devaluation that happened over that period, it's about 31%. Um, and between the 2015 and 2020, we are seeing about 94% um, um, devaluation in the currency. Um, of course, we can compare this to what we have as the, um, the investment return one year and also the inflation for that period. But I will not drop so much on this. Um, but one thing that is um, important to note here is that when we look at um, investment return, um, um, the total return, which obviously takes cognizance of the asset return, um, and also the exchange rate movement and inflation, um, um, it is we, we are not likely going to be just looking at from a linear view only. We want to be able to con to consider it from the perspective of compounded return to see the implication um, of all this um, on the return of the investor. Now, um, briefly, I'll just try to um, just try to hear what you just tried to do is just to um, um, show in a trend um, what the how the naira has moved um, in the last um, roughly twenty years. Um, in ninety nine, we're seeing a naira value of about ninety nine naira forty, uh, and currently about three eighty five at the interval. Um, now, what we've seen over that twenty year period. Um, linearly is, is a roughly 400% devaluation in the Naira. Um, and from what Nis said, if you, if you look at this um, chart, one thing that is obvious is that we do have uh, periods where we, which me mentioned as four year period or four, four or five year period. These are periods where maybe the devaluations do occur. And if you look at this trend, it shows clearly that yes, we do have um, every four or five year period, we do seem to have um, a devaluation in the currency. Um, now, this more or less speaks to the structure of the economy, which uh, obviously will not be going to that discussion because that is not the focus of the discussion today. Uh, but what we just need to do is, over the next 20 year period, what are we likely going to see? Um, this is not a, um, a projections um, webinar, we just more, it's more of trying to see what do you do as an investor um, having known that historically this is the way the currency moves, and what do you need to do in terms of um, stra strategic decisions that you need to make in terms of the, um, the kind of thing, how you hold your assets and um, um, make your investment going forward. 
Now, um, having seen what Nigeria has done, um, I feel it's also important for us to see is Nigeria, is it peculiar to Nigeria? Um, and um, from what we can see on this slide, um, is, is the, um, the consistent um, drop in value of um, currencies of, um, of the exchange rate um, is not um, a Nigerian factor, so to say. Um, it's, um, it's more of developing an emerging economy. And, um, and it's not, it's, it speaks largely to the structure of those economy and how well um, the output within those economies, um, the, more or less the balance, speaking to the balance of payment within, those, within the countries. And if you look at um, Kenya, for instance, Kenya over the same period, 20 year period, lost um, 150% of its value. South Africa, about 300%, Ghana, about 600% of its value. So this, this, this more or less just shows us that um, across different emerging economies, we do have um, exchange rate movements. Then also we try to see what happened to other um, uh, more developed economy. Um, and uh, I must add that um, this is a comparison of um, um, the exchange rates against the USD. Um, now, for the African economies, we've seen that um, Roughly between a 150 to 600 percent um, drop in um, the currency value is what we've seen in the last 20 years. Um, over the same period, um, if we see what the other currencies have done, um, uh, more developed uh, currencies, um, uh, for the uh, pounds, lost about 26 percent of its value against the um, USD um, over the same period. Um, Chinese yuan. Um, gained 18% and Euro gained 15% against the USD. So in as much as we see um, USD as a store of value, you do have currencies or some currencies that do um, gain against it. And, and as Nii mentioned, we, um, the, the, the store of value, uh, what, yeah, um, the store of value is, it, Currency is always well move essentially. We have a um, moving in currency, and uh, which is what um, we've seen here. None, none of the currencies um, are stable uh, effectively over time. Now, having seen the movement in um, exchange rates, um, it's also important for us, just like I mentioned earlier, um, movements in exchange rate from the perspective of an Nigerian investor now. Um, movement in the exchange rate um, is, um, is only one part um, of the story. Um, we need to also consider the other aspect of the story, which is the return, the assets that you want investing. We need to also consider what, um, what are the returns that those assets earn. Because um, total return takes cognizance of um, changes in exchange rates or against um, the return that you earn on the assets that you are investing in. Now, um, this essentially is just trying to see what kind of return that um, um, assets, Niger here we are cons comparing Nigerian assets against um, US, US Treasury yield. Now, um, the line on top is the, what's the Nigerian Naira um, Treasury bill now has earned over the last 12 year period, and um, trying to compare it against um, what the Treasury yield, US investing um, in the US Treasury, uh, what, it, what it earned over the same period. Now, if you look at um, um, uh, um, circa 20, 2009, um, um, you have a uh, more or less uh, interest differential of about 8%, and um, around 2015, you are seeing the interest differential of more than 12, um, 12, 13 percent, and right now uh, the difference is more or less like a four percent um, thereabout difference. Now, the what we um, shown here in this chart are essentially the average yearly average yield um, in those two assets. The one that you have on top is the Nigeria one year Nigeria uh, Treasury bill Naira, and the one below, uh, if you are investing directly in the U.S. Treasury. Um, we're seeing in dollar what what you are, what one will be earning, um, and over the 12-year period, what you are, what we've seen is that interest rates 
um, on Naira, on the average, has uh, more or less a 10% um, spread over the US Treasury yield. Um, at some point, we'll be answering the question, does this um, provide adequate return to compensate for the exchange rate losses that um, the country has witnessed over that, um, um, that same period? Um, uh, um, me answered it in, in his presentation. I will, I will also show it um, uh, later in, in the summary. If this adequately compensates um, for for the exchange rate um, losses that we've seen, then the next slide tries to show that is more. Like this one is showing because now um, investing in dollar assets is not necessarily just investing in the U.S. Treasury. There are other um, um, instruments that uh, one could hold in do dollar assets that one could hold, which um, offer a better return than the U.S. Treasury. And um, those kind of assets that one could hold are the euro bonds. Um, we do know that Nigeria and other emerging um, economies um, issue euro bond, and the yield on those euro bonds are much higher. And it's rough five um, are higher and better than what the U.S. Treasury yield offers. Um, now, in this um, in this slide, what this essentially shows is trying to just compare just one of the assets, just one of the instruments, um, Nigeria instruments, uh, the 2027 euro bond issued by Nigeria, which is issued in dollar, and the 2027 naira bond issued by the same government, Nigeria. And trying to, well, here we're trying to compare what the return on those two assets are over the um, roughly um, three, four year period since, since it, they were issued. Now, uh, the line on top is showing us the, the yield on the Nigerian era, and the one below shows us the yield um, on the Nigeria dollar bond. Now, before 2020, what we've seen is that the spread between the Nigerian bond, the, the bond issued by Nigeria in Nera has a spread of about 7.5%. But since 2020, what we've seen that is that the spread between the Nera, which is towards the tail end, uh, um, from January 2020 till now, what we've seen that is that that spread has thinned out and um, is now about 1.75%. And the question would be, this spread of 1.75%, does it adequately cover or does it ad adequately compensate um, for the depreciation risk that comes with ordinary naira assets? Um, while we, uh, before 2020, uh, with a spread of 7.5%, the question is, does this 7.5% adequately compensate um, for the depreciation risk uh, of Naira assets. I will answer that question um, um, in the summary. Uh, Nia has answered it already, but I'll also uh, make additional comments on that um, in my summary page. Now, um, um, taking cognizance of the compounding effect, interest differential of 6% over a long period of time, or 9% over a short period of time, has uh, historically um, compensated for losses arising from NARA devaluation. And uh, what uh, essentially I meant by that is that if you look at the previous slide, we have a period where consistently um, the, what you are getting on your NARA assets is 7.5% higher than what you get on the dollar asset issued by Nigeria. I'm taking Nigeria as, um, as an example here. Of course, we could as well be looking at other dollar assets issued by other um, euro bonds or assets issued by other government or in other um, assets. But essentially, when you do have um, a situation where the Naira asset um, gives a very good spread over the dollar assets alternative that one has, then it's essential for us to take consideration of the return um, effect and also see that does it adequately compensate um, for the um, depreciation risk that comes um, with NERA. Um, now, of course, holding a diversified asset in currencies give adequate consideration to asset return in those currencies. Um, just like Emily mentioned, um, the, when you talk about the strategic and tactical approach, um, the more or less the optimal approach would be a, a combination of the two, um, where the asset allocation considers that um, you need to um, adequately be diversified in the different um, currencies that 
one invest in uh, rather than investing in one um, asset. And I must add here that um, um, the, the, the policies, policies, monetary policies by the different um, countries and governments will always come in, into effect to dictate how attractive the investment in certain, whether I invest in the US um, assets, for instance, how attractive it would be, will always depend on, at that point in time, what are those, what are the policies of the government? Is it, um, are they such that it, uh, it, 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 they attract, it, uh, it makes the assets in those country, makes them attractive? Because you could have instances where you invest and they are changing policy that will always still come back to affect um, the investment return compared to investing in uh, other currencies. And now the the beauty about in, um, investing in different currencies is that once you invest in currency, most currencies, especially if you have a combination um, of if you invest across different. Um, assets and across different jurisdictions. The mere fact that uh, most of these jurisdictions do not have the same um, factors, or they do not um, react to the same, uh, to, they do not react to factors, they react to factors in different ways. Um, so all this comes together to ensure that um, even if one currency, policy in one currency is making it lose value, um, the likelihood is that so the policies in other currencies will um, still balance out the return that um, the investor would have. Um, invest, investing across currencies provide investors the necessary diversification and an edge against the local currency risk. Um, in as much as um, what people want to see will just be from the perspective of, oh, um, I'm losing so much in terms of um, uh, or the exchange rate just keeps going lower and lower by the year or by the day. Um, but the question that one needs to balance that with is uh, the return on your narrow assets, are they, adequ are they adequate to cover um, for, the, um, for the risk of the devaluation or depreciation um, that, comes, that comes with it? So th those, those are things that, those are considerations that um, the investor needs, needs to put into perspective. Now, um, for Mer as Meristem, as a group, what do we offer you? Um, we do offer you access to the global equities market. Um, we, we, we um, not just um, the U.S. market here, uh, access to about 20 um, global stock exchanges, um, such that if you need to um, make a decision to diversify your assets um, across um, those, um, across globally, across equities market, we do offer you um, an, uh, an opportunity to be able to do that. Um, also, Eurobond is um, also a veritable instrument um, that allows investors to um, diversify their assets. Eurobonds are government issuing, or even corporate in some instances, corporate and government issued instruments. These are dollar denominated, um, and this offers um, um, offers one better yield than what you can get on a U.S. Treasury, and also the fact that it's also um, dollar denominated. So yeah. Um, largely held edged against um, the depreciation risk that comes with uh, um, investment. Also internally, we do have um, fixed um, dollar and uh, um, pounds investment return, um, so which gives you um, um, also adequately hedge you against a, um, any Naira uh, risk. Um, also, we do have access to select um, markets um, globally in, uh, for real estate investment. Um, and above all, um, we also still offer you um, access to the Nigeria market to invest um, um, in good um, um, instruments and assets um, locally. Um, thank you. Thank you, Ewa Yusuf, for the wonderful presentation. Um, now, I'll just do a brief recap of um, the presentations before we go to questions and answer. Please, if you have any question, make use of the question and answer box to type in your questions. Uh, we have some questions already. Um, the first four people to type in or to raise their hands and type in their questions, um, we're going to be taking them. And also there'll be an opportunity for people to have live, to ask live questions. So um, the, first people, the first four people to raise uh, their hands will be called 
to ask live questions or others can easily just use the question and answer box. So the quick summary of the presentation is that um, we have annual depreci depreciation in the interbank and the parallel markets um, at around 6% and 6.3% respectively on an annual basis. Um, then there's over 95% probability that a devaluation will occur between five to six year period. Then also we have a 64% probability that a devaluation um, we occur between a one to two year period. And then also on average, we have 6% um, average depreciation, not devaluation this time around. Uh, also, um, investor will need to require around 6% premium in order to cover for devaluation risk, irrespective of the investment horizon. Also, um, we said, or one of the panelists also mentioned that Naira Treasury yield has provided over 10% spread compared to the US Treasury yield over the last 12 years. Um, also, we have FX liquidity risk. So we've looked at the premium over time. In order to measure the liquidity risk, the premium that investors should be asking for should be the differential between the spread of the interbank um, market and the parallel market. Also, we, the, the panelists mentioned some of the tools that we can use to hedge against foreign exposure. Uh, we've talked about um, maybe put options on crude oil price. We've talked about monitoring um, the external reserve. Uh, we've talked about looking at major, let's say, backlog of um, FX demand. All those things are indicators of potential depreciation. And in order to manage this dep um, potential depreciation, we've talked about strategic asset allocation and also tactical asset allocation, which more or less, more or less help us uh, to plan ahead and to also take advantage of um, short-term views of where the exchange rate and the market in general will be. So this is just a brief summary. Uh, so now we'll go into uh, questions and answer. I have uh, two questions here already. Um, the first one is from Taiwo Ola Lere. Said at this time of US dollar scarcity, is the tactical allocation approach feasible? How will the Forex be sourced to implement the strategy? So I throw this open to both Taiwo Yusuf and um, me, either of you can take uh, this question and provide the answer to it. Thank you. Let me, let me add to that. Sorry. Yeah, the, uh, so when it comes to tactical asset allocation, so essentially, given the laws in Nigeria, you have to source your dollar, you know, outside of the interbank market, even naturally. So, so right now, you can still get your dollar. It's just that, are you willing to pay the price? Because currently, you probably have to buy the dollar around 4 and 15 Naira per dollar. So people still source their dollars independently. It's just that they are paying higher price. So if you ask me, can you still implement tactical allocation at this point? Yes. Or just have to pay the price of 4.15 Naira per USD. And that then depends on, do you think that the exchange rate will stay depreciate further from that level? Uh, going forward. So, so those are the questions you need to have. But as far as getting the dollar, you can get the dollar. It's just having to pay the, the price in the right market. Okay. So um, let's take a live question. Uh, Mr. Essene, you raised your hand. Please, let's take your question. Thank you very much uh, for the presentation. Uh, I think my question also followed from the one they just asked about sourcing the, about sourcing the U.S. dollars. Well, you said you, they could go to, they could do that independently in the parallel markets. But the truth is that under the current mm -hmm. uh, regulation for FX in this country, there, there are what we call uh, eligible transactions. Does it really matter whether you are sourcing, where you are, which, which segment of the market you are sourcing your dollars for? There are certain things they call eligible transactions. And my understanding is that sourcing dollar from any segment of the market to do transactions that are not classified under uh, eligible transaction uh, is somehow illegal. And sourcing dollars for the purpose of making 
US dollar investment, either locally or offshore, is not among the, the list under the eligible transaction. So with this constraint, how, how do we uh, 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 maneuver the, 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 the constraint in sourcing US dollars? Thank you. Well, uh, let me respond to that immediately. My understanding of eligible transactions are transactions that are eligible to be funded in the interbank markets. And so, what? so I'm not aware of any regulation that says that I cannot buy dollar to invest in, say, dollar assets. There is no such law, unless if they want to pass a new one. So the eligible transaction that is the word eligible is eligible eligible to be sourced from interbank markets. So you can't go to the bank and say, okay, sell dollar to me. I want to use it to buy euro bond. But that's not eligible for that market. But if I can source my dollar from external sources myself, I can buy dollar offshore from any party and I pay the Naira, then I can use my dollar to invest in any legal uh, uh, asset. And dollar secure, dollar asset, and all that, they are not illegal. So, and again, uh, there is difference between the need to, you know, as portfolio manager or investment manager, our primary concern is creating value for our investors. So and we don't look at that from perspective of patriotism to the country, you know, because that's part of what some people will say that oh, if you are saying you should buy dollar assets, are you not acting against uh, Nigeria? You know, so the point is, I have eligible asset classes to look at as an investment manager. And at any point in time, I have to look at the allocation that is best for my, for my, for my investor. So please note eligible transactions for interbank markets. So just to thank add you. To that, sorry, just to okay. add to that, um, um, what the CBN clearly stated was that for eligible transactions, it means you can um, source those dollars um, from CBN through the interbank. Um, it's just, it's just the same way that the custom will not come out and tell you that uh, any of those 42 or 43 eligible items, they are not, they are not banned products that like cannot be brought into the country. They can be brought into the country. The only restriction is that you cannot um, access um, 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 dollar through the interbank um, to, for those transactions. So that is essentially what the CBN just restricts what kind of transaction they are willing to fund. Essentially, that's what it is. So, you don't, so okay. if you do have autonomous means of um, raising your, sourcing your dollar, of course, um, you can. All right. Thank you. So um, let me take two questions together. One is from Mubo Olasoko. She said, how can a local investor go about investing in U.S. Treasury? Um, the second one, Treasury bill and local interest rates have reduced to less than 2% in the past few weeks. How can you now validate local investments sustainability. So these are the two questions that I want you to answer now. Thank you. Well, uh, okay. Sorry. I think investing in U.S. Treasury, you can go through your asset manager or portfolio manager. So the same platform that, that allows them to buy euro bonds, we allow them to buy U.S. Treasuries. Mm -hmm. And usually day two, we have to deal with counterparties offshore or local banks. Uh, the local banks deal with the counterparties offshore. So so any dollar security you want to buy, so you can buy it through your portfolio manager or through your banks. So okay. Maristam, yeah, we do, we can buy, Maristam can um, do, um, buy um, U.S. Treasury or provide access to U.S. Treasuries um, for, for investors or for our clients, essentially. Yeah, okay, Mr. Tan, we see. on the second question of interest rates, the other okay. part of the question. Now, yeah. the second question. everybody agrees that the current interest rates are too low and they are not sustainable. And it's partly why the, the Naira is under immense uh, pressure. So at some point, at some point, you know, the Central Bank will have to revisit the interest rate policy. Otherwise, you know, the devaluation, there will be a significant uh, uh, devaluation. And one thing that we should also notice is this. So 
you know, we believe that we need the foreign investors to bring in money to stabilize the currency, right? Mm -hmm. Now, and that would be very difficult given the problem with USD liquidity. Uh, but domestic investors can be the key to stabilizing the currency. So if, you, if only that data is publicly available, I can imagine the accumulated US dollar position of domestic investors outside of the country because they saw better interest rates outside out there. So if there is better interest rate in house, say the interest rate locally go up by like 6% or 600 basis points from where they are currently, then they will have a decision to make whether to keep investing, keep holding the dollar asset or they should sell the dollar asset and come and end the IR interest rate. And they do decide to come and end the IR interest rate locally. Then they will have to sell their dollar position. And that inflow, the resulting inflow can just be what to stabilize uh, the, the, the exchange rates. But under the current, right. the current interest rate environment, I don't see that happening. All right, thank you. I know, sure. I know, I know the, um, when you look at the, um, the balance of payment, um, capital transfers are quite important. And just like you mentioned, um, remittances um, are a key component of that. One aspect would be for us to look at foreign investor buying local instruments, Nigerian instruments. But the other perspective that needs to also be considered is either in terms of the remittances from Nigerians abroad or Nigerians that do have um, 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 dollar asset abroad. You know, either way, what is important is that you do have enough inflows into your economy that, that can cater to your current um, account transactions. Although there also needs to be conversations around the current, current account um, transactions in terms of the, um, the country current account um, balance of payment. So all these things need to be put in perspective, but really when you do have local investors that bring in their fund or you have remittances, substantial remittances inflow, it probably can to, to an extent um, address um, the foreign inflows from foreign investors. All right, um, Tao Yusuf, just to follow on, uh, someone asked a question, what is the minimum amount one can invest in foreign assets. So maybe from a perspective of marriage them, if someone wants to invest in foreign assets, what is the minimum uh, investment amount that they can start with? Yeah, we cater to a different spectrum of investor of investments. Um, from the low end, we do have um, the fixed income return fund that we have. Um, investors can invest as low as, start with as low as $2,000 um, to invest in that fund. And um, of course that, um, graduated upwards over time, depending on the type of asset you want to hold. And if you want mm -hmm. to buy, um, you want us to source the um, um, U.S. trading for you directly or buy your bond for you um, directly, the, um, the, the minimum investment, um, um, the minimum investment amount for that um, can, is above $200,000. But we do um, cater to the different spectrum um, of investment. All right, thank you. Um, I'm going to call on Mr. Jalili at ABC to ask a live question. Um, Mr. Jalili at ABC, please, you have the floor. Let's unmute Mr. Jalili at ABC. Okay, uh, maybe. Yeah, I can see his question. I think, I think he has already sent his questions to the chat. I've sent oh, my question. Chat. Yeah. Okay, all right. So I will respond okay. to that question. And then what he asked is he's saying that. Now that some devaluation have happened, and we say devaluation typically happens once every four or five years, that is reasonable mm -hmm. for us to believe that, okay, there is not going to be any other devaluation anytime soon. You know, that's a very tricky question because CBN has yeah. done something called price adjustment, but I don't think the adjustment they made is adequate mm -hmm. for, the, for the situation we are in. Because right now we've lost half of our foreign exchange payments. So given the severity of our situation, you would expect the price adjustment to be deeper than that. So, and so that's why I cannot say that there will be no another devaluation. In fact, I even believe that there will be another round of devaluation because there has been no major devaluation yet as far as, as, far as I'm concerned, except they adjust the local interest rates, like we said. The only thing that can help them, you know, avoid a major devaluation anytime soon is to allow domestic interest rates uh, to go up. 
Okay, Th thank you so much. Uh, so uh, let us have a pop-up survey um, so that we can get your feedback about um, your perspective or what you think of um, how this webinar has, um, or how impactful you think the webinar has been. Uh, so please, you see a pop-up on your screen. Kindly uh, fill them while we still take further questions. Thank you. So um, there's another question from uh, Chidebiri. I don't know if I pronounced it correctly, apologies. Um, so what is your perspective about Forex trading as a sustainable source of income for individuals who have little to no experience? Is it that profitable in the short to long term as being propagated by many advertisers out there? Well, if I had that question uh, a number of times, you know, and usually results in some sort of fight, because my position is uh, a, somebody that is not an expert in an investment, you know, I, I, I think it's dangerous, you know, uh, trading FX, this, that's the third currency, international FX, man, because these are leverage products. And an average person that I know, you know, that does that, you know, typically end up losing the money. Now, even when they make money, you know, for some time, you know, because you are not a professional, they tend to lose that discipline. Then they increase the size of their position, the size of their leverage. Then one major move against them, then their capital is wiped out. And again, that particular market is 24 hours kind of market. So it has to, you have to be invested for you to reasonably expect, you know, a very good outcome from it. So I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't advise it. I don't advise it unless if you're an experienced uh, uh, investment sure. person. Even the experienced investment people lost money. And I can tell you that for a fact. So the volatility is just too much. So yeah. I don't have All right, yeah. So um, I don't know if we have any more questions or we have anybody that want to ask for the question. Um, so I think from a different perspective, trying to look at, um, like you've mentioned, there is a likelihood that we're going to see further adjustments or don't let me use the word depreciation of devaluation. So there's a likelihood that we're going to have further adjustments um, in the currency. Um, if um, the expectation of a recession eats the economy, how bad do you think um, this devaluation will go? That's a further question. I mean, you're asking how deep do I think the devaluation will go? Yes. Well, let me put it to you this way. Two things need to happen for us to have any sense of uh, stabilization. Now, the parallel market, as insignificant as it, as it is in terms of, you know, as, as size and all of that, you know, tends to, tends to reflect the... Uh, more accurately, the forces of demand and supply out there. So if, for example, if central bank can say, okay, let's devalue to 450, but even if they do that, it has to be complemented with increase in interest rate and domestic interest rates. So it's not just the level that it devalue to that will arrest the devaluation risk. So when they choose, they, they have options here, they can choose to devalue to 420, then they must then commit to supply the uh, BDC market to bring the BDC market rate to around that 420. And then they must commit to raise the domestic interest rate immediately after. That is what can stabilize. So it's not the level. So more than one, you can't just say, okay, let's devalue to 480. You can devalue to 480 people still after that. But you need to put measures in place to be sure that the parallel market is around whatever level you choose to take the currency to. And you must complement that by raising domestic interest rates by at least six percent from where they, they are now, you know, so that nobody will see any need to speculate against the naira. Then whoever mm -hmm. and the people that have invested in dollars can then sell their asset and invest in naira asset. And that's how we got out of the problem. But then the last time we did the valuation, major devaluation in 2016, it was followed with a I uh, with a raise in interest in interest rates so that we don't keep having uh, the same uh, situation. Then also something happened during the last devaluation. You know, it was not publicized, but the central bank 
they supply dollar, they found a way, the government found a way to supply dollar to, the, to that parallel market. Mm -hmm. Like I told you, the spread between the parallel market and the interbank market is even managing that spread is more important than choosing the level that they want the official exchange rate to be. But once that spread is gone, speculation stops. So then stability mm -hmm. normally returns. Exactly. So, mm -hmm. so they have flexibility. So they can choose the level where they want to end up with. It's just that these three things must happen. You choose the level, then make sure that the parallel market rate converges to that level, whether you're going to supply parallel market in order. And you raise the interest rates, domestic interest rates, you know, to, 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 to prevent further uh, speculation. But the level can Thank be you. in order. Yeah, thank you so much for, for, for the wonderful presentation and the answers to the question. Um, both the panelists have done a wonderful job by addressing uh, the questions and also by going deep into the major issues that is affecting investors and their confidence in the sustainability of the currency. So thank you. I would like to invite the Deputy Group Managing Director of Maritime Securities Limited, uh, Mr. Suleiman Hadidokun to give uh, a round of address. Yeah. yeah, over to you, Suleiman. Okay. Uh, thank you, Anu. Uh, I would like to appreciate the panel and Taiwo for that wonderful job. They provided insights to this topic. The topic is actually very, very significant, especially in the world we live today. The world we live is a vocal world, so volatile, uncertain, I mean, complex and ambiguous that you can't predict what will happen next. And nobody is actually immune in terms of investment activities. You have several exposure for those doing financial planning, for those engaging actively in portfolio management investment activities, there are lots to gain from this particular uh, webinar. I mean, I've learned a lot too. Uh, when you look at yourself, you have school fees to pay, or you are even doing retirement planning. And you discover, you discover that you can't just put everything within the country as an investment. You need to expose yourself one way or the other to other shop in terms of investment activities. In fact, one of the key objectives of having a good return investment is also diversification. Because one of the ways of adding value to an investment is by achieving three key areas of minimization. In terms of the cost, the risk, and taxes. How do you achieve this? You just need to do, I mean, you embark on offshore investments. But do that, one needs to be very, very conscious. You need to be very careful about it. You need to engage professionals who know their own own and who can do it very well. And really, for us at Meristem, the objective is fulfilling our brand message. And that brand message is let's take you further to the next level. Let's take you further. Let's take you to the next level. One of the ways of doing that is how do we edge your investment? How do we minimize your cost? How do we make you to how do you prevent you from falling victim of the situation of volatility in the entire world? I remember a client telling me that, I mean, he, he didn't have any investment offshore. And now the value of investment, when you look at it in dollar terms, is not about. But this will have been prevented by probably, I mean, taking some offshore investment. And in aging portfolio obligation, you need to also be careful. It's definitely that you can't do it alone. You need to engage partners. And at Meritem, we stand with you in that journey. We look forward to engaging more on this and many more other topics that will be able to add value to you that will take our client to the next level. And this is our promise. And this is what we start to deliver. We look forward to you and pray. And please uh, pray God to be with all of us. Please keep safe and trust me to you next time. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Arnold, for that wonderful uh, accord. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Suleiman. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for attending the webinar. Uh, you will 
uh, be informed of our next webinar and the topic we promise you is going to be a topic of importance to you and it's going to be a topic that will also help you towards your wealth growth journey uh, like Suleiman rightly mentioned our objective is to take you further and we are actively working on that objective to make sure that we help you achieve your financial goals and objective so thank you for the for your time and thank you for sticking with marriage them you've reached the stars now let's see you conquer galaxies you've gone for gold let's show you to what kind of success do you look for no 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 gold if it's the small kind you can go at it alone If it's huge, no matter how good you are on your own, you need partners. Partners who can help maximize the potential of your wealth. You've come this far, let's take you further. Mary Stem, let's grow wealth for you.